of his mouth, and he's walking amongst these lampstands, and he holds stars. And he tells them what all of these symbols mean. And then chapters 2 and 3, he writes letters to all the churches, which are the stars in his hand, and the lampstands that he's walking around. Those are the churches. Those are the churches. After this, he sees this vision of heaven opened up, and he sees what's worshiping God up in heaven. So this is the worship of God in heaven. Who are the elders, the 24 elders? Ah, good question. The short answer is, there's, there's, there's a couple of good answers. To say definitively, well, they mean this, no one knows. But I would say these represent the covenants of the old and the new. The governing covenants of the old and the new. The 12 apostles and the 12 tribes of Israel. As the mediators of both the old and the new covenants before the throne of God. By the way, when we get to the story of David, when he ordered the priests, he ordered them in squads of 24 regiments. There were 24 priests that would take uh, turns rotating who to do all the temple sacrifices and duties. There were 24 of them. So the whole ministration of the temple was organized around 24 Priests. I don't want to say chief priests because that's not that's not what they were. They were they were designated the the, the, the custodians of them. All right. So it's interesting that when we see the throne room of God in this temple format, that there's 24 elders. Yes, most commentators seem to think that this is Old and New Testaments blended, and I would think that most of what you read in the Book of Revelation substantiates that. But it also has reference to this possibility that these are the governing elders of the whole temple in heaven of God, like there was in David's temple. And this was a vision by John? A vision given to him, by, given to John. John was, not John the Baptist, because he's no. already dead. No. John, who was with Jesus at the yes. cross. Yes, okay. yes, yes, that's true. Yes. John the Apostle. John the Apostle, yes. Thank you. Now you got it. Okay. <laughs> now, so this is, the, why am I pointing this out? Because this is reflective of the worship of God here. This is the worship of God here. Where am I pointing? Uh, Genesis. Genesis. What about the worship of God here? Where am I? John. Revelation chapter 5. And I saw in the right hand of him who was seated on the throne a scroll written within and on the back, sealed with seven seals. And I saw a strong angel proclaim with a loud voice, Who is worthy to open the scroll and break the seals? And no one in heaven or on earth or under the earth was able to open it. Verse 4. And I wept much that no one was found worthy to open the scroll and look into it. Then one of the elders said to me, Weep not. Behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has conquered. So he can open the scroll and the seven seals. Who is that? Jesus. Now we have a reference to Jesus. And where is he? In the throne room of God. Keep reading. And between the throne and the four living creatures among the elders, I saw a lamb. Jesus is referenced as the lamb more in the book of Revelation than by any other title. It's no wonder when we get to the end of Mass, just before communion, we hear a concentrated effort. Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. Happy are those who are called to his supper. Because this is the number one title that's given to him in the book of Revelation. Specifically in this throne room vision. So what are we seeing? Chapter 4, we have just a throne with someone sitting on it. We, we don't see a, a face or a name, but we see the, 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 the lights and we see the rainbow. We see the seven... Uh, the seven uh, torches. We see the elders around him. And now John sees in between the throne and 
the elders, a lamb. What is scary looking? He has seven horns and seven eyes. Oh yes, I saw a lamb as though it had been slain with seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God. Now, that was mentioned earlier in chapter 4 as the four torches. What does this mean? That the spirit proceeds from the Father and the Son. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Son and with the Father and Son, He is worshipped and glorified, right? Here is a reference in here where the seven spirits are before the first throne and in front of the Lamb. The Spirit proceeds from the Father and the Son. This is the Trinity being worshipped in heaven in a symbolic manner. Is Jesus a lamb with seven horns and seven eyes? No. no. These are symbolic images <laughs> to show that the Spirit proceeds as much from the Father and the Son because He is co-eternal with the Father and the Son. With the Father and Son, He is worshipped and glorified. Right? Okay. And He went out and took the scroll from the right hand of Him who was seated on the throne. And when He had taken the scroll, the four living creatures fell down before the Lamb, each holding a harp full of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. And they sang a new song which says, Worthy are you to take the scroll and to open it, for you were slain, and by your blood you ransomed men for God, only Jews. Right? No. No? no? What does your Bible say? No, men, all men. From every tribe and tongue and people and nation, you have made them a kingdom and priests to our God, and they shall reign on earth. This is the connection between Old and New Testaments combined. It's not for Jews only, it's for all peoples. The church of God is all people who come to him, whether you're Jew or Gentile. No. 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 Do you see this? So why am I emphasizing this? To show what is happening in heaven, John has given us, has been given a vision of what happens in heaven. The worship of God both for old creation, by you all things were made, and the worship of the Lamb, by which you ransom all men. You got it? Mm -hmm. So this is Jesus in Genesis. Okay. Do we have the Holy Spirit in Genesis? Yes. Very good question. Genesis. 1 verse 2 The earth was without form and void and darkness upon the face of the deep and the spirit of, the God. Spirit of God moved upon the face of the water. <laughs> well, and there's a reason for that. You should have a footnote because in Hebrew the word is ruach. R-U-A-H. Ruach. The Ruach of God moved upon the face of the waters. What is Ruach? Ruach means breath. It also means spirit. It has a dual meaning. The breath of God. When you get to Exodus and it says God breathed and separated the waters of the Red Sea, the word breathed is Ruach, 
So one could say God breathed and separated the waters. It was the Holy Spirit that separated the waters physically so that they could draw, walk on dry land to the other side. Do you see that? When it says God breathed into his nostrils the breath of life and man became a living soul, okay? It's the Ruah of God. It's the Spirit of God that he breathes within that clay making of man out of the dust of the earth. So God puts himself into man. That's lovely. Isn't it? it is. I love the Holy Spirit. Oh, I love the Holy Spirit too. That's why we always ask him to be with us because I'm telling you, he is the one that leads us to Jesus. He is the one that will make us like Jesus. He is the one that will transform us into being, or I like to think of him as the polisher of our souls, that we can better reflect to the world what God wants us to reflect, and that reflection is going to look like Jesus. How do you know when you're speaking Jesus, God, I mean, I know it's all three one. Is there a difference when you pray or something? How do you know if it's one of them stand out? No, no. They are co-equal, co-eternal of oh God. Makes no difference. It's all God. It's all God. It's a good question. So when we address the Holy Spirit, we're addressing God. When we speak to Jesus, Lord, have mercy on us, we're addressing God. When we speak, our Father who art in heaven, we are speaking to God. It's all the same person. Is the whole, like, in the Bible, I'm still learning my Bible, sorry. Um, does the Holy Spirit say things, like, in the Bible? Like, is there, is, does the Bible anywhere say, like, the Holy Spirit said, or is it just not really referenced that way? That's a good question. The Holy Spirit. Yes, the Spirit does speak. Okay. Yes. More so in the New Testament than the Old I, that I can think of offhand. Except if you think about the prophets. Whenever the prophets speak, they spoke with the, by the Spirit of God. Is the Holy Spirit when they all spoke in different, they all spoke in different languages? Yes, that's them. That's, that's Pentecost. Okay. She said, was that the Holy Spirit when they were all speaking in different languages? And I said, yes, that was, that's a gift of the Holy Spirit. Uh, that's still available today because it's the same Holy Spirit back then <laughs> than it is now. Yes? It was also the time that when Jesus left, the, the, you know, said, I'm, I'm going away, but I'm going to send you my spirit. Yes. No. That's the Holy Spirit. Yes. Right. yes. Right. When Jesus said, I'm going away, he said, I'm going to send you my spirit, that's the Holy Spirit. Very good. These are all very good questions. See, I take some of this for granted. So I want you to ask this. Everyone good so far? Everyone following me? Okay. All right. Oh, uh, this is just the end of the Sabbath rest. Uh, this is the story of, of uh, Jesus talking and cleansing the temple. In John chapter 2, that's the Sabbath rest, making it holy. Remember when Jesus cleansed the temple, he said, you know, this is my house, the house should be a house of prayer, but you made it a den of thieves. Okay? So again, that's making that holy. That's, that's that seventh day of creation. Okay, I want to move along. Okay. Forgot to put this in, click me more, but oh well, that's fine. Let's go to Genesis now, Genesis 1, 26. Let's focus a little bit on this. Let's look at the creation account a little deeper. This is the creation of man. God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness. Stop right there. How many gods do we worship? One. Why is God saying we and our if there's only one? Why don't we say, let me make man in my image? 
Ah, now we get to one. He said, because there's three persons in the Trinity. But I'm a Jew living before the time of Jesus. What do I think this means? How many gods are there? One. One. God made it very clear to Moses. Hear, O Israel, the Lord is your God. The Lord is one. That's Deuteronomy 6.3. You're all good Jews, so let's turn to Deuteronomy 6.3. See, you've got to understand our Jewish heritage, otherwise none of this makes sense. You realize that the whole of the idea of monotheistic belief is very new. It's not been the common belief of humankind for thousands of years. It's only with the advent of Judaism that we get this idea of one God. One God. So, in Deuteronomy 6, 3, are you ready? This, you might say, is the first creed that God more or less prescribed to his people to recite. Hear therefore Israel and be careful to do them, that it may go well with you, and you may multiply greatly as the Lord God of your fathers has promised you in the land flowing with milk and honey. Verse 4, are you ready? This is how you're going to prosper. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord, and you shall love the Lord your God with all of your heart, and with all of your soul, with all of your might. Boy, that sounds familiar. I've heard that before. Well, before that, someone else mentioned that. Who said that? You shall love the Lord your God with your whole heart, soul, strength, body, and mind. Jesus said this. Where do you think he got it from? Deuteronomy. This command that God gave to Moses to the children of Israel has not gone sour. It's not, oh, let's do the Jesus thing now and forget everything in the Old Testament. Honey, nothing has changed in the Old Testament. Jesus just made it more accessible for us to do it. He commanded them. Did you hear that? Read it again. Verse 5. 